Welcome everyone on the second talk from our analysis, testing and automation track in session room one here on Saturday on DEFCON CZ. Hope you're having a great time. Let's welcome our speaker, Shrey Anand, whose talk is data-driven resource tiers for OpenShift apps. Uh, Shrey, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Uh, hi all, I am Shrey Anand. I'm a data scientist with Red Hat. And today I'll be talking about data-driven resource tiers for OpenShift apps. This project is a team effort of the AI Ops team in AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. And let's get ahead. So um, I'll talk about the backstory of the project to give you a little context and the test environment that we work in. And then uh, I'll formally define the problem that we worked on and the solution that we came up with. After that, there'll be a small demo where we, uh, where I'm gonna walk you guys through uh, the notebook where we implement the solution. And finally, there'll be a discussion session. So uh, <clears throat> before we define the problem, it's a good idea to know some of the open source environment that we work with. The first one is uh, the Operate First initiative. So I'm not going to go into details, but um, the basic premise here is that software is available through open source. And uh, the difficult part now is to operate them. So Operate First initiative helps in developing and operating cloud applications. So as a part of it, we have a cluster deployed with an Open Data Hub instance. So Open Data Hub is a blueprint for building an AI as a service platform on OpenShift. So if you want, if you want to build AI application, you can do that using ODH services. In this case, we are using the Jupyter Hub service to run the model notebooks. In the Operate First spirit, this project leverages data generated from operating the Jupyter Hub application. And um, if you want to know more about the Operate First initiative, you can just go to operate-first.cloud and get all the information regarding that. So um, we, like I said, we are working with the Jupyter Hub application. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it's a cloud application for data science development. So it allows data scientists to train model um, and then do inference and then visualize your models as well. So uh, since we are trying to operate this application, it's a good idea to know a little bit about how it works. So we have a front end of the application, which uh, starts with a spawn page that has some configurations for us to uh, tweak. And I'll quickly show that to you. So this is what a Jupyter Hub homepage looks like. So the first configuration here is the notebook image. So in this case, we have selected operate first Jupyter Hub analysis notebook image. What that means is when we select this, we'll have all the dependencies that we require to run the experiments in this project. So uh, once we select this, the other important configuration here is the deployment size. And this is precisely what we are working on in this project. So here you can select from small, medium, and large. And what that essentially means is that you have uh, basically choice of what CPU resource you want and what memory resource you want. So uh, traditionally, these values are arbitrarily selected by the cluster admin. And what we're trying to do is uh, introduce some data-driven decisions here. So uh, that's the front end of the application. The back end has, uh, when we start the server, selecting those configurations, on the back end, we have OpenShift pods that get spawned. So for each user, there will be one pod that, that gets spawned with the memory and CPU that you selected. So, um, so this was a lot of information in a very short time, but uh, the main point here is that we are working on the operate first cluster and uh, the Jupyter Hub application. And then we are trying to come up with these configuration tiers. 
so um, why we are working on this project and why do we care so we had an incident on our cluster where we had a cpu pressure so what that means is like we had a large capacity of cpus on the cluster but still new users couldn't be onboarded because the existing users had requested all the cpu resources that were available when we uh, took a deeper look into it we found that the actual cpu usage by existing users was way less than what they were requesting so um, the existing choices that were presented to the users was something like one two four or eight cores and four being the most frequent choice but um, it, it makes sense if you have physical systems that do a lot of things together but if you're running a notebook it a lot of the times you don't need that much resources so um, what we did was we tracked uh, what the usage of users were and using that we came up with uh, some smart choices for request and limit parameters so uh, before we formally define this problem it, we have to first look at request and limit these are two parameters that a pod specifies before it, it is spawned on the open shift so request is resource that is guaranteed to be available for the pod. So uh, if it requests one CPU, then it, it will have one CPU forever. And limit means that resource that the pod may use subject to availability. So if the pod says it needs four CPUs as limit, then that means if the other three are available, then it will be uh, allocated to that pod. So what we want to do is given patterns of resource usage where resource can be CPU, memory, GPU, or PVC, we want to recommend requests and limits for configuration tiers. Configuration tiers were the small, medium, and large that I showed on the spawn page, such that the difference between cluster resources requested and used is minimum. So um, what are the pros of doing this? One obvious thing here is that we are going to uh, have less wastage of resources. So uh, if the difference between what we are requesting and what we are using is minimum, then obviously we will save resources. And if we save resources, we save money and energy. The uh, other benefit here is the opposite case where we are actually requesting less than what um, we actually need for our application. And in that case, we will see performance degradations and application throttles. So in that, in that case, we would want to recommend uh, requesting higher configurations. So, um, right, so this project can also find application in other um, services like Superset and Spark, and also some managed services like Rhodes. So now diving into what we actually did uh, to come up with request and limit. First of all, the data that we're looking at is telemetry data of AI Ops data science team. So we tracked a group of data scientists for three months and um, we got their resource usage for every second and then for uh, better computational analysis we downsampled it to five minutes so we have three months of this data set and we use that for the analysis so the basic idea here is that we want to group users based on the resource consumption um, so what that means is let's say we have 10 users on this application uh, and then three of them are uh, power users or in, in a way have high CPU requirements. Three of them have medium CPU requirements and four of them are just like uh, reading some notebooks and not really doing a lot of computation. So if we are able to automatically group these users, we can use that to uh, come up with configuration tiers 
um, that can you know minimize the difference between resource requested and what we're using, which was our uh, problem statement. So um, right. So next, I'm going to go through the notebook that implements the solution. Um, Right, so this is the repository where all the code lives. It's AICOE AI Ops and Operate for Jupyter Hub Analysis. Uh, I'll have all the links towards the end of the presentation if you're interested. So I'll walk you through important parts of this notebook. Uh, if you're more involved, you can have a detailed look at the EDA and also play with the code yourself in the Jupyter Hub environment that I showed. So, uh, this notebook is for CPU analysis, but we also replicated this for memory and uh, then aggregated the results to come up with the resource allocation policy. Um, so in this notebook, the first important thing is to fetch the metrics or fetch the data of the, um, of the data science team that we tracked. So we specified the Prometheus URL that helps us to collect that data and have the right authorization. Once we do that, we have uh, we have three metrics that we're interested in, port CPU usage, port CPU request, and port CPU limit. And uh, at the end, we have a data frame that looks something like this. I'm just gonna zoom in so that it's more visible to you guys. Right, so uh, we have a data frame that looks like this. So this is a pod ID and uh, it corresponds to a user who spawned it. And then for each pod, we have these timestamps at five minute interval for three months. And then for each timestamp, we have the usage request and limit uh, values for that pod. So once we have this data frame, we can actually go ahead and visualize this and come to this graph. Um, so what this is showing us is the time frame on the x-axis and uh, the metric values on the y-axis, where the green line at the top here is limit, uh, the orange line in the middle is request, and the blue line here is usage. So what, that, what this graph shows us is that the usage is around 0 to 1 CPUs on average, uh, and the requested value is around two to four, while the limit limit value is around four to eight. So we definitely know there's a scope for scope of improvement here. Now the next important thing here is the clustering algorithm itself. So um, before we jump into that we have to look at the features that we used for clustering. So we have the, uh, if you look at this pod, uh, if this data frame, we have pods here and each pod or each user is represented using a vector of quantiles. So intuitively what that means is, let's say this is pod B. And uh, if you look at this value, so this says that pod B requires less than 0.0025 CPUs 80% of the time. And uh, if we read this number, it means that pod B requires less than 1.8647 cores 100% of the time. So this is the maximum this pod ever requested in the duration of three months. So uh, we represent all these users uh, as a vector of these quantiles. Once we have that, we can come up to uh, the, this picture here, which is a two-dimensional uh, version of the vectors that we just formed. So what this image is showing is that each dot is a user and the space between them tells us how they differ from each other in terms of their consumption. So uh, we can run a clustering algorithm on top of this. In this case, we use the k-means algorithm. And 
it will find these colors. What these colors are showing is it's automatically finding the groups and uh, coloring them. So we see this orange group here. We see this big chunk of group here, which has basically um, blue and yellow colors, and then another chunk here, which has uh, green and red colors. We can see, see it as five different groups, or we can also club some groups together. So in this case, since these two uh, groups are pretty together, we can club them. And then we can look at uh, the consumption patterns of each group and see if they actually differ. So once we do that, uh, we can see that this is the small group, this is the medium group, and this is the large group based on like how they're consuming. And um, the next thing here is the resource allocation policy. This is where uh, the cluster admin comes. So um, here uh, we can uh, define how we want to split between the request and the limit parameter. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying that whatever the pod is requesting 99% of the time, that should be covered in the request, while whatever they're requesting 100% of the time, that should be covered in the limit parameter. So um, what we see is that for the small tier, or the small group, uh, the request is 0 0.003 and the limit, limit is 0 0.07. For the medium tier, we have request as 0 0.12 and limit as three CPUs. And for the large tier, we have request as 0 0.5 and limit as nine CPUs. So um, if that wasn't a lot clear, we can also look at the graph here. So what this is showing is uh, the density of uh, the CPU usage. And we see that we have a big spike here. And the black line shows the request parameter that we set. So that means like 99% of the time, uh, the workload will be uh, given the CPU that it's requesting. And uh, the limit is towards the 100%. This is for the small tier. And similarly, we have the graphs for medium and the large tier as well. So, uh, so what's the impact of coming up with these tiers? And so we looked at the percentage of resources saved if we use these configurations. And we found that uh, we save about 91% in requests. So essentially, we are requesting a lot less, which uh, correlates with the actual usage of the pods. And uh, um, if we look at the overall utilization, which is like the fraction of CPU that is actually utilized over what is requested, we see that there's a jump from 0.7% to 10.9%. So um, that's the conclusion of this notebook. We have got the configuration tiers that we were looking for, small, medium, and large. And um, we see the re resource reduction or like the pressure reduction that we were aiming for. So, um, so what actually happened with the analysis? So this recommendation of configuration tiers is actually integrated with the Jupyter Hub instance that we use now. So the container sizes, small, medium, and large that I showed in the beginning are actually uh, specified with the analysis that we did. And um, so this project is uh, an example of uh, data-driven decision-making and also an example of AI ops where we help operations of application using AI tools. So uh, the next steps here is to automate this approach to work with any downstream cluster or service. So right now, the operate first cluster would act as an upstream project where we are using this tool to come up with the configuration tiers. But um, whichever cluster downstream or whichever service downstream wants to use this should be able to, right? So we want to automate this approach 
and then also test this with other applications like Spark and SuperSight. Uh, that's most of it. There's also another concept that is similar of vertical pod autoscaler. It is different from our project uh, in the sense that it works on a single pod and it works on optimizing um, the resource usage for a single pod. Whereas we are looking at the application level and all the users that are using the application and also plan to look at the cluster level. So uh, different application using the same deployed on the same cluster. Uh, so I think that's my time. And uh, I hope you guys found this useful. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Also, the project material is available here. We have the repository. We have the Jupyter experiments, the operate for support repository, data science Slack, and my email address as well. So, Cool, Shari. Thank you very much. Uh, for the audience, feel free to ask questions either on chat or on the Q&A channel. I don't see any questions for now. Uh, let's let's give people a little more time. I, I personally found this presentation very interesting because we have something very similar to uh, ourselves in OpenShift CI, where people are submitting us uh, tests, basically what are CI test jobs with some requests, and we build a similar system that watches uh, their consumption over time. And we actually build a mutating admission webhook for, we, we don't suggest people uh, what kind of resources to consume. Uh, we overwrite whatever they're specified with the actual consumption. So uh, I'm... Uh, so one, so of my, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my questions would be, how do you deal with... like it, What if something is eating resources like beyond your top tier? Or is your top tier like unbounded? Uh, so the top tier that we define has like a limit of what the maximum user ever requested in the three month period. But even after that, if your workload is something that uh, is not covered by the standard tiers, you can always request for a custom resource. And uh, we have on the operate first support repository, you can just create an issue and there'll be the cluster administrator making a custom resource for you. And based on the availability of CPUs or GPUs or whatever you're requesting, uh, they can allocate that for you. So that will be an exception case, right? And for your point on uh, just overriding uh, the consumption things, I think that's also what the vertical pod autoscaler does. And it's troublesome for applications like Jupyter Hub because it has user pods. So if you override the consumption and kill the user pod and then restart it, it might just stop whatever computation that they're using. So um, AI can always recommend. It cannot make decisions for you as of yet. <laughs> right. All right, I don't see any, any other questions. Uh, if you want to reach out to uh, Shrey on the work adventure after the session, feel free to do so. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Shrey. It was very interesting.